Let's talk about your collaborative case and your collaborative case template. So again, you have two options on how to handle your template. You can make edits to it at the master template level, which means it will always be there for the future unless you delete it. Or you can make edits to it once you've pulled that template into a particular case and just make edits for that case because maybe something applies or does not apply. So let's assume for purposes of today that we have already pulled our template into our individual case and we're editing it before we activate it. So one of the things you need to consider in your collaborative case is what your pleadings will be. You might have a joint petition. So that's uncommon in other areas of law, obviously, or other types of family law cases. But if they're divorcing, it is common and collaborative to see if they want to file a joint petition and that is allowed. So you want to determine that and not just be quick to file a pleading. You want to determine if they want to file a joint pleading. And this may not happen until after the first meeting. And they're not usually in a hurry for it to happen. There could be an exception to that. But I think we normally think we get a divorce in and we go file the pleading. In collaborative, we get the divorce in and then we create our team and then we set the first meeting and then we have the first meeting and maybe at that meeting we just discuss are we going to follow joint pleading or individual pleadings. So that's one thing you'll have to determine. And you'll note when you're looking at the template we have two lines of information. The first tells you determine if following a joint pleading. If you see this I in the blue circle that indicates that there's more information and you see the next one does not have more information. You can just hover over that eye with your cursor and it will tell you what the additional information is. Or you can click on it and you'll see that the additional information is under action plan. The action title, which in this case is determined if you're filing a joint petition, that only allows 255 characters. The action plan allows you as many as you need. So. You might have a additional information here that you want to include or if the template's already been activated and you're the one being assigned that action, it's nice to just be able to hover over that and see that there is extra information. Then you'll need to determine if you're filing an answer. So perhaps the other side's already filed a pleading. It's not going to be a joint pleading. They've already filed the original petition. Then of course you need to file an answer. So that's just your reminder to do that so the court knows that you're before the court. And in collaborative cases, we need a notice of collaborative, and that's how the court is put on notice that it's a collaborative case, and that's how the statute comes into play, which requires the court to basically leave you alone and let you handle your case. They can't set you for trial or make you do anything for two years as long as you file appropriate status updates. So you have to file a status update at the six month mark and at the year mark. So when you draft your notice of collaborative, um, you can't file it until after the participation agreement is signed because it has a reference date in there for that. And when we draft our notice of collaborative, I like to include a second page that states what the status update dates are that are required by the court. And then the court signs it. The court likes that because they like to have a docket entry. They like to have a date in the future to write, to schedule something. And I think it helps with their docketing system. And then they're less likely to accidentally set you for a dismissal or accidentally set you for trial because they now have that docket entry that the status reporters do. So it's a really good practice to include that with your notice. Then eventually, right, when we get to conclusion, one of our pleadings is going to be the decree of divorce. And this is a reminder and a way to assign that to someone in your office. And um, there's some general notes and reminders and when you're drafting that decree. They're obviously a little bit more involved than typical decrees because of the creativity allowed by collaborative. So let's prepare for our first meeting. So preparation through the first meeting. And this is a step-by-step -step guide for you or your uh, professionals in your office. One of the things you're going to do right away is hire neutral professionals. I prefer to have neutral professionals in all cases, all collaborative cases, 
I strongly prefer that. Um, and I think that if you have a neutral financial professional or a neutral mental health professional, you're going to have much more success. And selling that is hard for, sometimes because it's hard for the clients to understand, oh my gosh, why are we hiring all these people? But the way that I explain it to them is, first of all, I just state it as if that's how it happens. So I say, in collaborative, we have a neutral financial professional and a neutral mental health professional. So I don't say you have the option of, or maybe we would, or we might hire. I just say, in collaborative, we will be hiring a neutral financial, neutral mental health. And then I explain to them that the role of the mental health professional, if you have children, they're going to help you with your parenting plan. Whether you have children or not, they're going to help direct our meetings and they're going to help us to deal with the normal emotion, anger, fear, sadness that gets in the way of the deal so that we can get your deal done. And my experience is that we're able to get there faster with the help of a mental health professional. And they're neutral. And then the neutral financial planner, their role is they're going to help us to deal with organizing and, and gathering all the information. So we're going to have to gather the financial information so that we know what we're dividing. They'll help us to figure out if there's anything difficult to value and what steps to take to deal with that asset. And then they're going to lead us in the discussions about option development to divide your assets and debts. And one of the things that I tell clients is what's the amazing power of the neutral is if they say something, it holds a lot of power and it is not met with suspicion. I could say the very same thing. It could be the greatest idea ever and I had it. But if I say it, it is met immediately with suspicion by the opposing party because I'm the other person's lawyer. So they immediately meet that idea with, What's the hidden agenda? What are they really after? Same exact idea said by a neutral. They don't have to go through all that suspicion. So it's very powerful to have the neutrals and it helps advance the case. And lawyers don't always like it when I say this, but the truth is, and a way to sell it to your client is, we are shifting money from the lawyers to the neutrals. So it sounds like they're going to pay additional money, right? Because they're hiring all these other people that have to be paid. But the truth is the work they're doing has to be done by someone. So if we don't have a neutral mental health professional, guess who's going to be doing the parenting plan and talking to them about what is your traditional Christmas schedule? What should we do about Christmas in the future? They do that typically in collaborative offline without the lawyers there one person instead of two lawyers one mental health professional talking about Christmas and their rate is often less than the lawyers rate <clears throat> it's certainly less than two lawyers rates so that is really just shifting money right from the lawyers to the neutral mental health professional and financial planner someone has to gather all that financial information and put it in a spreadsheet so if we don't have a neutral financial professional I'm gonna be doing that or my staff is going to be doing that. So again, they're going to pay for it. It's just shifting money from the lawyers to the neutrals. So that's a good way to explain and sell it when it sounds more expensive to the, to the hesitant client that really it's probably not. And I don't know if you want to say this or not, but they're also probably more qualified. I'm not a, a financial professional. I'm a lawyer. My background is not in financial planning. So some of the questions that come up about taxation issues, or about how does this 401k plan work, how does the Roth IRA different than the traditional IRA, the neutral financial professional is probably more qualified to answer that question. So that's a good selling point to get your team together. So very first step in the case, when you get hired, assuming that you've already talked to the other lawyer and they agree we're going to do this collaborative, is to hire your professionals. and. Um, I'll have a conversation with the other lawyer and say, who do you think would be good to hire as a neutral in this case? And things you would want to consider is personalities. So as you work with more of the neutrals, you'll kind of see that, you know, they all have different personalities. And what are the personalities of the clients? Maybe um, you would consider what is their profession. So for example, if one of the clients is a financial professional, they are going to need an probably a gray-haired financial professional and not a really young financial professional because they're not going to listen well 
possibly in any case to another financial professional, but they certainly need someone that they could have respect for. So maybe that's true also if you have kind of a narcissistic businessman who they might need somebody with a little bit more years before they're going to listen. So you might consider those things. And gender, you might consider gender if both lawyers are the same gender, so it's me, we have a female lawyer, do we really want to have two female neutrals? Now everybody in the room is female except for the poor husband. So you might want to ensure that one of the neutrals at least is a man so you have a little bit of equality at the table. So those are things to think about when hiring a neutrals. Now once you and the lawyer agree, then you're going to send out an invitation to the neutrals and you're going to ask them, um, would they like to participate in the case? What is their hourly rate and do they have an initial retainer requirement? And the reason you need to know that is if they say yes, that information is going to go in the participation agreement. So you might as well go ahead and ask and save yourself a step on the emailing. Um, and if they have time and availability, I'm sure they would be delighted to be on your team. And then somebody is going to draft the participation agreement. And that's a great paralegal job if you have a good paralegal. And I really, really value the Collaborative Law Institute of Texas forms. And we have gained their permission to use, to include their forms on our web, on our website. And you can also go to the Collaborative Law website to make sure you have the latest and greatest form. If you are a current subscriber to Smart Legal Practice, they'll be updated on our site. But if you're not for some reason, which would be a shame, then you should go to the Collaborative Law Institute of Texas. You have to be a member to obtain their forms um, and make sure you have the latest form because they're very good forms and they've been created by professionals in this arena and they're very thought out. So you want to have go there for your participation agreement. And then when you're drafting the form, a little tip, if you see something in brackets, so brackets are different than parentheses, right? So parentheses are rounded, brackets are more squared. If you see something in brackets, it is a hint to you or to your paralegal that some of that information that's a communication to you in the form. It doesn't stay in the form. So it might be saying, if you have children, put this in here. If you don't, take it out. So nothing should remain in brackets. Um, and sometimes people aren't clear about that, but that's a good little tip. So after you prepare your participation agreement, there is a collaborative intro email that we recommend and that we have a sample of for you on the site that basically tells the clients, here's what we're doing, here are the professionals we've hired on your behalf, and gives them a bunch of attachments. It attaches the participation agreement, the roadmap to resolution, um, a goals worksheet that they need to fill out, and uh, a couple of other documents. So this is a great sample email. You can just copy it and it comes from the team. So if you don't have a full team yet, if it's just you and the other lawyer, then it would come from you and the other lawyer. And meaning, it's obviously just going to literally come from one person, but you're going to put at the bottom of it all the names of the people that it is from. And you want to think that way, team mentality, through the whole collaborative case. And one reason that you're sending this um, intro email is they're getting the same information at the same time, and the goals worksheet, we need them to complete before the first meeting. And in this intro email, it confirms the date of the first meeting and it informs them that the team is going to have a call before that meeting. So we have a team call before that meeting to get the team all prepared, and I'll talk more about that call in a minute. Um, but it informs them that that's going to occur so they're not surprised when they see it on their bill, and it confirms the date and time of the first meeting. So the goals worksheet, which is attached to that email, is a place where they list out, it's a form again of Collaborative Law Institute of Texas, and they fill out, they answer questions about what are their goals, interests, and concerns. They're going to be asked in the first meeting to say their goals. So you want to have them complete that and provide it to you in advance of the meeting, and then you need to have a call or a meeting with them in person to prep for that first meeting to help them prepare for when the mental health professional is going to turn to them and say, well, what are your goals? So they'll be ready. Okay, 
then we have we recommend drafting a fact sheet and someone in your office could do this for you or you could do it yourself but my experience is on that first team call you're going to need to tell the rest of the team important facts about the case in an organized manner and you only have so much time on that call so again I learned this this is you're benefiting from me doing it the hard way first used to I just have my file in front of me and then the mental health professional would say Melinda how old are the clients I think I don't know so I'd be digging through the file for their birth dates how old are the children is anybody in therapy so we have created a form of all those questions that the team wants to know you might as well just have them on one sheet of paper ready for that call and we've designed the form in smart legal practice so it can be filled out as a form with fields in smart legal practice for you so it's easy and it has all the questions that we think that you're going to want to have for that call and then you sound so prepared on the call when they when you start out you say well let me tell you a little bit about my client they are employed at such and such they are this year's old they're in counseling with so and so so it's an easy way to appear amazing like you have an amazing memory okay schedule the first joint meeting so if we really will have, would have done this in most instances before we send out that intro email, right? So let's say I'm looking at my template and I think, you know what? That really needs to be further higher up on this list. You can just move it. So watch here. I'm just going to move it right up here to put it before prepare collaborative intro email because I just realized hmm I think they're gonna have to schedule that meeting first before they do that email so you can move anything around in in the templates you can delete parts of the of your master template or you can delete parts just in that case you can move things around if you prefer a different order so they're very easy to work with okay so scheduling the first meeting that is um, challenging because you have a lot of calendars that you're trying to schedule and when you're scheduling the meeting, it's going to be a two-hour block typically with 15 minutes before the two hours that just the team, the professionals meet, and 15 minutes after the two hours that just the professionals meet. So we have a little prep time and a little debrief. And when you're scheduling, there's two ways to go about this. You can do a meeting wizard or similar tool where you suggest some dates and times and you send it out and then people, everybody else, matches up with those or you can send emails and I have some paralegals who prefer one method and some who prefer the other I think the challenge with the tool that sets the meetings is there's not always a lot of flexibility so you have to designate a specific time so maybe you designated 9 to 11 on Monday and maybe someone could do 915 or 930 there's not really a way to indicate that on the tool so I think that's the frustration with the tool but when it works it's great and it's a lot less emailing so whatever works for you but we're gonna have to schedule that team you might want to protect the clients from a lot of the scheduling until you at least match up the team and then they'll be less frustrated so you might not include them on the emails at first just get the four calendars of the team and then offer some options to the clients okay everything you do in collaborative just like your um, other cases is you want your client to preview before it's published there's a little exception here in collaborative oftentimes the team is approving it before the client sees it and an example would be that intro email that we talked about that has all the attachments to it that you would run by the team because you're sending it to both clients so in collaborative we also when we do get to the decree drafting phase the professionals get on the same page about the decree before it's published to the clients and that takes a little shift in our thinking because in a traditional divorce that isn't collaborative I would draft the decree I would send it to my client my client and I would get on the same page and then I would send it to opposing counsel but in collaborative it's the opposite I would draft the decree I would send it to the lawyer we would get on the same page and the other professionals once we all like the form of it we send it to both clients and the reason for that is maybe lawyer Joe and I go back and forth on the some of the wording 
not because there's some hot dispute and lawyer Joe is trying to take advantage of my client or vice versa. It's just wording issues or ideas how to improve it. But if the clients see that whole back and forth, again, they meet it with suspicion. They think, oh my goodness, if lawyer Joe wants it, how are they trying to hurt me? So they don't need to see all of that exchange. So it's better if lawyer Joe and I have resolved all those issues and get on the same page, which we always do eventually on the wording, then we publish it to the clients. And then they don't have to worry about, well, you wanted three words here and he only wanted two words there. Let's have less stress for them. Okay, so we've got an approval. We have a reminder here to get that approval. And then we have a proposed agenda. So there is a sample agenda on the system um, and you can obviously edit it to whatever works for you, but there are standard things. And the big picture is that the first meeting is mainly administrative in that we go over the highlights of the participation agreement and sign it and we set the goals. And then we could have interim issues, meaning let's say that immediately they need to decide how are we sharing in the bill paying or how are we sharing the children on a temporary basis. You may not have time to get to all that. Some of that may have to happen at the second meeting, but some people are very efficient. It just depends on the, the personalities. Are they big question askers? Do they ask a lot of questions? Or do you go over the highlights and they just sign the participation agreement? Are they ready to set their goals? <clears throat> are they prepared? You want to definitely prepare your client because it's embarrassing if you're in a room and there's goal setting and one client clearly knows what's going on and they're ready for everything and the other client doesn't. So you want to take the time to prepare your client for that first meeting and then they will be more comfortable, less surprised, it'll be less embarrassing. Um, and in that first meeting, we're going to have the agenda and we tell them we may not get to everything on the agenda. But in collaborative, we always have agenda. We don't want any surprises and we have to draft the agenda, publish it to the team first, get the team's approval, and then send it to the clients. And it's best to send it a day or two at least ahead of the meeting so that if the clients have questions about the agenda, why isn't this on the agenda, I want to add something to the agenda, there's some time for that to occur. <clears throat> so we have the first agenda. And then the paralegal or you, whoever's working on the case, needs to schedule a team call, and it's going to take about 45 minutes to an hour for before that first meeting. And that's where you're going to have your handy fact sheet that you've already prepared where you know all the answers. And in that call, we're going to talk about, typically the mental health professional would lead the call, and we would talk about if we don't know each other well, <coughs> or if some parts of the team have not worked together, we'll talk about collaborative and our styles and how we want the first meeting to go, is there any concerns about how the goal setting is, is presented, so on and so forth. And then they'll want this facts and background of the clients. An example of a conversation about how the goal setting might go is every mental health professional, you know, does it slightly different. One thing that I do not like is I do not like it when they, when a mental health professional or anyone leading goals tries to force common goals. So, for example, they're going to turn to Susie Q and say, what are your goals? And she'll say, well, one of my goals is that I want to have a stable environment for the children, and I want to have a place to live, and I want to have retirement, and I want to be civil to Joe Bob. And then we turn to Joe Bob and say, Joe Bob, what are your goals? And Joe Bob says, well, I never want to speak to Susie Q again, and I want to live in the house no matter what. And I want the kids to go to the best private school in the area, and those are my goals. And then the mental health professional tries to force common goals by saying, well, don't you want a civil relationship with her? Isn't that a common goal? Well, he just said he doesn't. He never wants to speak to her again. And I don't want him to either have to lie because he's being put on the spot or have him say the truth, which is I never want to speak to her again. So it isn't good to force common goals. And I... Just tell the mental health professionals, please do not do that. If they see a common goal, if they both say, I want to have a great co-parenting relationship with my ex, 
If they both say that, I think it's fine to observe. Look, it looks like you have a common goal here. We can circle that. I think that's great. So that's the kind of discussion you might have about how do you present the goals. There's one mental health professional who puts them in four categories. So it's good to know that because it's upsetting to the client if they didn't prepare them that way and they just have a list and now the mental health professional is saying, you know, one of her categories may be ch um, related to the children. The next one may be financial. And, and so then the mental health professional is saying, Susie, tell me your goals related to the children. Well, Susie wasn't ready to do it that way. She just has a list of six goals. She didn't know she had to put them in categories. So if you have the conversation with the team ahead of time, how do you present the goals? Then you can prepare your client better. So the timing of all this is important. You would want to have a communication to prepare your client for the meeting, the first meeting, after you've had that team call. Because you're going to glean information on the team call about what needs to be on the agenda, for example. Because if I represented Suzy Q, and Suzy Q didn't know, there's a big temporary issue that has to be addressed at the first meeting. Well, I'll learn that on the team call, because Joe Bob's lawyer will tell me that. So you definitely want to have um, time on your schedule to meet with that client or talk with that client before the first meeting but after the team call. So this kind of step-by-step -step helps take you through that. Okay, so this is a reminder to schedule a call or a meeting with the lawyer and the client to get the goals worksheet. I like to get the goals worksheet from the client ahead of meeting with them because it's not just one question, you know, it's probably five or six questions. I like to read through it, study it, think about it, think if I need to help them to restate some of them a different way that's maybe less provocative or less, you know, combative. And I don't want to do that live while I'm meeting with them. It'll be a waste of their time. So I like to review it in advance. And then when I meet with them, I'm prepared to say, hey, I've reviewed your goals. What do you think about this? And I even sometimes um, will pull out of the goals worksheet kind of what I think the list is based on what they wrote and that's helpful so you need a little prep time and also then you don't have the client show up with no goals worksheet which is not helpful so definitely have the paralegal on them to say hey where's your goals worksheet Melinda needs it for that meeting then you're going to finalize the agenda so after you've had the team call the team will talk about what the agenda is going to look like you will have already published it to the team in a draft form so on the call we can finalize it and then we'll need to finalize it and get it out to the clients. Then we're going to create packets for the first team meeting. My preference is not to have folders, actual folders for everyone. I just like to have paper clipped a bunch of documents because they're not that many. And so the first meeting, your packets, and I call them packets, you want to pack it for every person attending. So the possible people attending the meeting, you can have the two clients, the two lawyers, possibly the two neutrals, in my case, I really prefer that. And then you might have a minute taker. And I like to bring a minute taker because I think it is hard. Traditionally, the lawyers have taken the minutes. We're gonna have minutes of every meeting. And traditionally, or at the beginning, the lawyers took them. Well, it's hard to interact with everybody and participate in the meeting if you're trying to take minutes. So I start bringing a minute taker. And I think that's really helpful to everyone. The team loves it. So you might have a minute taker. Well, they need to pack it because they're the ones who are going to try to take minutes of the meeting. So you definitely want to bring a packet for the minute taker. You could have an observer. One way that people get trained and collaborative is they ask to shadow a team. And so the observer may be there just watching, not participating. Um, sometimes they participate a little bit. Depends on the teams. Some teams don't want them to say a word. They're a potted plant. And some teams say, sure, participate. So it would depend on the team and you'd need the client's permission to have an observer. But I've only had one case where I wanted to have an observer and the client said no. That's fine, you say, that's fine. But you might have observers, so if you have an observer, they'd need a packet. So you wanna count how many humans are gonna be in the room for any reason and have enough packets for all of those people. And we have a note on here that we want um, the paralegals, if it's your paralegal preparing it, to make sure the other paralegal isn't preparing it. So the snafus that can occur is you think they're doing it and then we end up with no packets or 
Nobody talks about it and everyone does the packets. So now we have two sets of packets. You know, we don't need to kill any more trees than we need to. And that's embarrassing because it shows a lack of coordination. So you definitely want the paralegals to communicate and, and figure out who's doing the packets. Oh, and tips, it has tips in here like don't staple the packet together. And that sounds silly, but the reason is what happens logistically in the meeting is the agenda's on the top of the packet. Well, as we're working with other documents, people like to pull their agenda separate from the document they're working with so they can still have their agenda in front of them. Well, if it's all stapled together, they can do that. So I prefer that they be paper clipped and not stapled. Okay, reminder on here to book a conference room. If you're in a situation where you share a conference room with someone or you ha we have an executive suite in one city, then you need to book a conference room. So there's a reminder to do that. And then I have confirmed the conference room because <laughs> there's nothing more embarrassing than having a whole team standing in there with no conference room. And then arrange snacks. Collaborative law has snacks, which is fun. And there's a theory that it helps um, psychologically to have snacks at the table and have people, you know, able to eat if they need to. So if you're providing the um, meeting space, then you would normally provide the snacks. So there's a place on the template to assign that to someone. Okay, then we have a template or a category for prepare for future meetings after the first meeting. And we actually have a whole separate template for that. Because what we realized is you don't know how many future meetings you're going to have. So you may have three meetings in that case, or you may have 14. So with this template, you can pull in that future meeting template every time. So this is a category that has very little in it because we've created that separate template, which I'll take you through in a minute. And then prepare for your signing meeting. So your signing meeting, I think one of the challenges is of collaborative law is there's no real deadline. And in trial, we have a real deadline. We have a trial date. And in collaborative, we don't. So sometimes we have to create one to motivate the less motivated person to get this over with. So when we're getting close to the end, we might schedule a signing meeting. You can always move it if you're not done yet, you know, but it makes the clients feel better to understand the roadmap and understand there is going to be an end to this. And the signing meeting is also very helpful because once the decree is drafted and we've published it to the team, we've published it to the clients, there will be small changes, issues that hadn't been discussed, that we had to put a little note in the decree, not sure how you want to handle this, that we can make those small decisions and changes live. So we can come to the signing meeting, make those live, and then print and sign. We have in the past tried to do a lot of that by email. So you start sending emails out, hey, nobody talked about spring break, how do y'all want to handle that, it just got left out. And the emailing becomes so involved and there's so many misunderstandings sometimes that it takes up a lot of time and isn't very fruitful. So our experience is it's better to just hold those questions, just make a note of them, and then at the signing meeting they can answer them quickly. You can make a changes live, print. You could also have your ancillary documents there. So this says print the decree red line and clean so the red line is where we've made those notes and indications to the clients that there's unresolved issues we would prepare an agenda so your signing meeting might say go through decree and resolve open issues sign decree sign ancillary documents um, have notary available to sign over uh, power of attorney on the cars things like that then confirm notary. So if you're going to need a notary because you are going to have a power of attorney on the uh, car or some other document that requires notarization, then this is just a reminder in the template to make sure you're going to have a notary there. Some teams like to give gifts to the clients at the end. Not all teams and not all cases would it be appropriate, but if you wanted to do that, there's a place in, in the template for that. Um, and in the past, examples have been a gift card for a massage or a gift card for a dinner out or something like that. Um, and then you'll want to confirm which documents require signatures, because not all do, of course, but some do. And we listed all the documents that are common so that you have them all there. 
then print them all, have them ready. Make electronic copies of all the documents. So you could, after we've signed, scan them all and either just publish them by email to everyone or you could put them on a thumb drive and hand them to everyone right there. And then we have a note to publish everything that's going to be assigned in advance. So nobody ever wants to be surprised, right? So if you publish everything, this is what I think we're signing. Um, then everybody could be prepared, have all their questions discussed with their lawyer before that. Okay, so let's go to the template about future meetings that I told you about. So that was our collaborative case template, but when you go to the master template list, you will also see collaborative meetings after first meeting. Now this is for every single meeting after the first meeting because you're going to have steps to take between the meetings and you want to have a checklist to help you through those. So one is whoever took the minutes is going to have to draft the minutes. So if you had a minute taker or if you're the minute taker, you'll want to make sure you get the minutes drafted. Send the minutes to the team first, again, before the client, so the team can say uh, if they had any you know, comments about the minutes. One thing that I do is I like to tape record the meeting for purposes of minute taking. So we get permission of the clients to tape record the meeting so we can have very accurate minutes. And then we tell them that once the minutes have been approved by the clients, we delete the tapes. I've had great success with that because you don't ever get into a dispute. You just listen to the tape again. So if somebody on the team or the client say, I don't think that's what we agreed to. I don't think that's what we said. We just say, here's the tape. Listen to the tape. So it resolves that memory issue. So if the team has changes to the minutes, maybe a word choice or we need to say more about this, we don't transcribe it from the tape word for word, but it helps us to have the tape to give an accurate summary then um, we'll make any changes to the minutes. Then we send the minutes to the clients. <clears throat> we may need to, to schedule additional team meetings. Sometimes that's done in the first team meeting as we'll schedule one or more additional team meetings, but if we've run out of them and we need to schedule more, then that would be something to do. And then we'll need to schedule a team call. So between every team meeting, between each team meeting, we need to have a team call. And that's not going to be as long as the first one. So the first one's 45 minutes to an hour. This may just be 30 minutes. But it allows the team to prepare for that meeting and to talk about, you know, life is going on with these people in the meantime. So they're calling us. They're calling someone on the team and saying, oh, my gosh, guess what happened? So it allows us to share that information and to be prepared for what needs to be on the agenda and have that agenda prepared. And then schedule client calls. I like to have a call right before the team meeting and right after. Sometimes the same day, like literally. 3 o'clock I'm talking to the client, 3.30 I have the team meeting, then I have another client meeting, client call at 4.30. <coughs> and the reason for that is, if there is drama going on, it, if I talk to the client a week ahead, there could be, that's a whole other week of drama. So I like it to be close in time, so I have the latest drama to tell the team, and then I like to talk to the client after the team call to report. And that might, may or may not be necessary. If there's nothing to report and the agenda is what I expected, then I'll just tell the client, I won't call you, I'll just email you and say, no need for a call. But if there is something to report about, okay, this is what they're concerned about and this is what's going to be on the agenda, then I'll like to have that call scheduled. And it's, we're going to usually use a conference calling number for the team call and it's really handy to have someone, you or someone in your office, send a reminder to the team of that call right before the call, uh, the day before or right before, with the call, conference calling number. So they're not having to dig it out of wherever they had it. And then we'll draft the agenda for the next meeting based on the call, finalize agenda, publish the agenda like before, and then it's nice to have a reminder to the clients of their homework. So in the first meeting, they're going to get homework. And the homework may be gather all your financial documents and give them to the neutral financial planner. Things of that nature. And I know this will shock you, but they're not always good about doing their homework. So it's nice to have a reminder of, hey, the meeting's coming up. Don't forget to do your homework. And we have homework too. So maybe someone on the team needs a reminder. But in any case, it never hurts to get a reminder 
and then you want to make sure that the minutes have gone out so confirm with your minute taker that the minutes went out and the goal is that they go out fast so everybody has a fresh memory and so that if there is homework which will be listed in the minutes they're aware of it so first it goes out to the team and they approve them it might get stuck there though so you might get them out you send them to the team but the team isn't replying so it's hard to get them to clients so there might need to be a little follow-up there and then you're going to have packets again to prepare for the next meeting so that's repeated and then one thing that's on here for your new meeting is create a whip or a bill a whip meaning a work in progress bill so it might not be your billing time of the month but it's good to run a whip so that you know where you are financially with the client because a common item on the agenda is um, professional fees and this is for two reasons one we want to stay current and get paid of course but two the clients don't want to be surprised they don't want to get a bill you know months and months later that is huge and they didn't know they were incurring that so it helps to keep the clients aware of what's happening in their case and how their retainers are going then again you're going to have book the conference room confirm the conference room get the snacks and then you're going to have calendar the status report due dates so remember um, that previously we did the notice to the court and we had status report due dates well we don't want to miss those due dates it's going to be six months from now so it might be easy to forget so you want to put those on your calendar so you don't forget and then right before the meeting I like to remind the client or have someone in my office remind the client to review the minutes because they are going to be asked to approve them and I can't tell you how many times we're in a meeting and we say do you approve the minutes and they go oh and that we have them there in front of them that's part of our packet I'll talk about the packet in a second but they haven't read them or they can't remember so we'll save their money and time if we remind them you're going to be asked to approve these in the next meeting so go ahead and read them and be ready to say yes or no and if no what your issue is so in our packets your agenda will be on the top of the packet and then everything the agenda refers to will be in the packet and what I mean by that is we often look back at the clients goals so we set goals in the first meeting so the goals will be in the minutes of the first meeting we just lift those goals out of the minutes and do a standalone page of goals so those will be in every packet and then it, and you'll do it in the order that the agenda lays it out there will often be an item on the agenda that says review the roadmap to resolution so the roadmap to resolution talks about all the steps in a collaborative case and typically the neutral financial professional will guide us in that step of the agenda and tell them okay we're on number three and this is what's happening or we're in option development that's number five so they can see that their case is progressing so you'll have the roadmap in your packet and then um, it will have the minutes from the last meeting because if they forgot to approve them at least they could review them real quick on a break or something and approve them so just look at your agenda and that'll cue you on what you'd want to have in your packet and that is your template for preparing for your collaborative case